Good morning. How are you? Great. I heard one great. I heard two. <laughs> uh, you know, I just wanted to start by saying, um, you know, with uh, the flooding, do you remember the flooding just three years ago? And in some of your houses, I know even here, were affected by it. Um, I know C Carlos, uh, many of you know Carlos that comes to church. He usually comes first service, but he's been really hurting in his back um, for quite some time. And so he hasn't been in church for, for a while. Um, but he had to gut his whole house. His, he didn't have a basement. And his main level was destroyed. Um, it can happen here. It definitely can happen here, like Tola said. We just don't know. We're not promised anything beyond this, this moment right now, right? And, uh, and with that in mind, I, just, I feel like that just really kind of goes along with what the theme I believe God has given me for today. Um, just wanted to reflect just before we get started. You know, the, f the flood that was here, um, we actually here at the church, some of you know this, some of you don't, but the flood was very close. This was 2013, I think it was August, September, um, but the, uh, the flood itself was very close. To the center point was close to this building, um, a little bit further south. And I think it was closer to maybe Mississippi and Havana. But we received so much water primarily because the sewer was backed up. And we're like the lowest point of, of virtually about probably four or five blocks on the south side of us. And you know, when floods come, um, it literally t took so much trash and debris and dumped it right here in our front area. I mean, it was just covered with um, trash, with um, people's tools and things like that from people's backyards. Um, you know, f God uses, I believe, God uses floods to cleanse. He did that in the days of Noah. He cleansed the earth, truly, right? And so God is doing something. And you know what? It was, honestly, it was his mercy on the 2013 that the water did not actually come into this building. If I, I was doing this at first service, but if you consider this the door of the church and this the concrete stoop or the concrete step right outside the door, the water covered the step, but it did not get inside the door, which was miraculous. I mean, it was within an eighth of an inch of just pouring in is my guess. I don't, because we were here, Amy and I were here, someone else, Lisa was here. Lisa, there you are. Yes, and we, yeah, we experienced several hours here just watching it come around. You know, and this was kind of a, somewhat of a funny thing, but you know, the truth is, it's like, I feel like God just put a, like a, like a, like a blockage from the water coming in until um, there was like this big dump truck that went down 6th Avenue and it was tall, but it didn't have any problems getting through the water and it created this wave that came down. And this wave, literally, we were watching it out the east side here and the wave caused water to come in. But besides that, it didn't. It was about maybe 10 feet of this like plume of water. And then in my infinite wisdom, ha ha, I came over here like, well, let's see what it, the water's like on this side because you can go out this exit over here. It's kind of an emergency exit. And, and I just like was watching this car go by and it was like, well, that's kind of cool. They're making it through. It was a Humvee, but not very smart. I'm like, okay, here comes another wave. And I'm like trying to shut the door really quick and I didn't make it fully in time. I got half the water out and half of it came in. But uh, anyway... Uh, God was merciful. But, you know, I truly believe that even if water comes in, God is still merciful. Because God is doing something. God's doing something in Louisiana. He's doing something in our nation. And it turns people to him. So let's just pray. Lord, we ask that your spirit would come in an amazing, miraculous way. Holy Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit, we we ask you to just show yourself. Reveal who Jesus is. Reveal your love. Reveal your grace. Lord, we love you. 
but we love you because you loved us first. God, the order is not us first, it's you first. And so we look to you now, we just pray that you will expose yourself. Expose your love, expose your grace, expose who you are into the hearts of every person here. Lord, we desire to know you, to meet with you. Father, for your word to really penetrate our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every person here. Bless them a lot so that we might be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, I want to start today by saying that as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself a lot today. This is, a, this is a, an intense topic, let me say, today. We are going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And can you believe it? We're actually going to finish the book today. Yay. That requires praise to God. <laughs> Um, would you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16? We're going to read this chapter. It's not real long. It's 24 verses. You know, but I want to start before we read and mentioning about a man in Scripture that has an incredibly amazing testimony. A testimony that I think all of us would like to have. And his name is Enoch. Enoch. And Enoch is a very short, about, short amount of information about his life in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. But Enoch was known for primarily one thing. Maybe I'll say two things, but I want to pick up on the one thing. And he is known primarily as one who pleased God. You know, I mentioned this before a few weeks back that he is also one that's known as never dying. He's one of two people. And the reason why he didn't die is because he pleased God so much is what I believe. And the scripture indicates that. You know, the, I want to alert your attention to something in the New Testament about his life. It says, by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. That's an awesome testimony, isn't it? You know, if I was going to pick what I could put on my tombstone, I would say this is, hopefully it would be true, that I would be one that pleased God. Wouldn't that be awesome to be known that way? And that's how Enoch was known, as one who pleased God. And so I just want to look at that a little bit more carefully today and what that means. You know, the next verse, and I don't have it on PowerPoint, but it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what that tells me is that Enoch was a man of incredible faith. He was one that stuck to his faith. You know, and and honestly, it doesn't matter how much faith we have, God calls us to use the faith that we do have, small as a mustard seed, right? And if we use the faith that we have, we can please God. And Enoch was one that consistently pleased God. So I want to ask you, before we read in 1 Corinthians, last week, did you please God? Yesterday, did you please God? Think about it. You know, and I bring up that question not to bring condemnation because I think every one of us can go back and like, well, I I know I didn't handle maybe everything right and this was a problem and um, we can all do that. And so my intention is not to bring condemnation in any way, but it is to reflect back on our lives and to say, did we please God? Did we please God when we woke up this morning? The first things that we did. Did we please God in how we've spoken to people? The things that we did, that we do the things that God wanted us to do. You know, this is the kind of thing I believe that Enoch lived with. He lived asking God what pleased him, and then he went forward and did it in faith. 
You know, the definition of a Christian doesn't have anything to do with pleasing yourself or pleasing someone else, pleasing your spouse. Although if you're married, you want to please your spouse, right? And you want to please others. But being a Christian doesn't mean it isn't about pleasing others. It's about pleasing God. It's about pleasing Him and His heart and what His desires are. There's honestly, there's nothing more important. A Christian's primary goal should, number one priority should be to please God. Would you agree? Please God. You know, every time we face a decision or anything in our life, we need to ask, will this please God? Well, what I'm going to do or what, whether I do this or that, what pleases you, God? Or something else should I be considering? I want to please you. <clears throat> we live life for one reason, to please God. That's why we're here. God made us for his pleasure, right? And God wants us to return that and please him. You know, Christianity means giving up your life. And as Galatians 2.20 says, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How many really love that verse? <laughs> That's a hard verse. But the truth is God wants us to live for him. He gave his life for us. And that's why we have life today in the spirit and in the natural. God wants us to please him. Luke 17, says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. If you let your life go, you will save it. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I want you to think about pleasing God through this. As I read through it, just consider the different things that are coming up. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I give to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come... I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate to me to go along, they can travel with me. I am coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia, for I am planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter, and then you can send me on my way to my next destination. This time I do not want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while, if the Lord will let me. In the meantime, I will be staying here in Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. When Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He is doing the work of the Lord, just as I am. Don't let anyone treat him with contempt. Send him on his way with your blessing when he returns to me. I expect him to come with the other believers. Now about your brother Apollos, I urge him to visit you with other believers. But he was not willing to go right now. He will see you later when he has the opportunity. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece. And they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. I am very glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, don't you wish you could say that up here with me, have come here. They have been providing the help that you weren't here to give me. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. You must show your appreciation to all who serve so well. The churches here in the province of Asia send greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. All the brothers and sisters here send greetings to you. Greet each other with Christian love. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. 
If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Our Lord, come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. So I want to tell you, I tried to to pronounce that name probably 30 times. I just blew it. But that just happens when you're up here. Um, You know, I just want you again to think. Think about pleasing God. You know, this chapter talks about, I think, several areas of pleasing God. Um, It talks about money and what God is asking from us for money in in a lot of ways. Um, I'll go into some details about that later. But also, you know, it talks about um, taking care of Paul as the apostle, as he has been feeding them and how to please God that way. How to please God with with other workers, Timothy, the other ones that are giving their lives to the service of God and to encourage them, to support them, to appreciate them. Um, You know, a lot of this chapter is about appreciation or about pleasing God in my mind. And and one reason why I picked this as a theme today is because I think that this is really an overriding theme for the whole book. Of 1 Corinthians. How do we please God? You know, Paul did not keep this book light and breezy by any means. He brought up a lot of tough stuff. It has not been easy for Amy and I to really bring forth what we believe God is saying through the scripture. We haven't done it perfectly, but we certainly have been prayed and asked God that we could speak the way and what he wants from his word. You know, Paul lays it right out there. And I believe, and I'm just going to do a quick summary, but how you please God, and starting at the very beginning, uh, Paul said, follow Christ. Don't follow people, follow Christ. Don't follow Apollos, don't follow me, follow Christ. It's not about you, it's not about your wisdom. Watch God use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God is bigger than our own wisdom. It's about him. It's about his wisdom. Watch out for sin. It leavens the whole dough. It affects everything. Sin gets in and it affects and it changes you and it changes those things around you. Sin such as spiritual pride. Be careful of that. Sexual immorality. It'll destroy you. Don't associate with those indulging in sin because it'll affect you. You know, bad company corrupts good morals. Don't bring a believer to court. You know, he's very specific in a lot of his things that he said. Honor the marriage covenant. Don't cause others to sin. Those are just a sampling of things that were listed in here. Uh, You know, that's not to mention, you know, 12... 13 and 14, when it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the love chapter and and how God wants to use those things, although they're not necessarily well-received outside the church walls or even in lots of other church walls. So a lot of tough topics. But how do you please Him? You walk in the Spirit. You do what He wants. You listen And you do. Do you want to please God? I'm going to ask that again. Do you want to please God? Do you know how to please God? That one's a little harder to answer, isn't it? You know, and it's it's a moment-by-moment situation and really trying to hear God's voice and do what He wants. And then following it in faith. You know, Enoch, I don't think Enoch knew exactly what to do, but he walked in faith and it was commended to him. And then God took him. And I think in a little bit of a picture of that is as we please God, as we really seek to walk in faith, that he'll remove us out of situations a little bit like God removed Enoch from this evil world. God can remove us from evil circumstances. Others 
settings. You know, a little bit like God just picked some people up and they appeared somewhere else. God can do that. The miraculous is God still works today. You know, but pleasing God has a lot of uh, opposition from the enemy and even things in our own lives that we bring into our own world. So let me share this because this is one I think is significant. In 2 Timothy 2.4, it says, one, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I want to pick up on one word here and that is entangles. You know, when I think about, think about entanglement, what do, you, what do you consider? I think about um, being entangled by a spider web. If you run into a spider web, it is hard to get it off. If you walk through one, it's sticky, it's gross. If you're an insect, you're pretty much dead, right? <laughs> Thank God we're not insects, right? But it entangles you. It gets you stuck to it. And there's things in our lives that we get stuck and it affects us and it can kill us just like that insect. I want to bring up another example because you know that I like to plant gardens and I, I brought in a corn stalk a couple weeks ago. Um, when I plant corn, um, there is a danger with corn that maybe some of you know and some of you don't know about. And what it's called is called suckers. You ever heard of suckers on a corn plant? If you see, this is actually one stalk, even though it looks like it's four. There are three suckers that surround this particular corn plant. And the suckers, in a lot of ways, look like you're getting new stalks. And they even grow leaves like the rest of the stalk. And it looks like you might be able to get more fruit and just leave it be. Well, my father-in-law told me once, don't let them grow because you'll lose all your fruit from it, which is the truth. Because what happens is these sucker, suckers grow on the sides. They grow up and they take a lot of the nutrients that are required to actually build and strengthen and, and produce that fruit on the main stock. And so you got to kill off those, those suckers, cut them off, literally. Otherwise, you will not produce anything from the corn. Not every corn stalk has suckers, but a lot of them do I've, from experience. But I think it's a good picture of what happens in our life. We can let things grow in our lives that are literally taking away the nutrients of God that really suck away those things that could actually strengthen us. Those are the entanglements. The scripture actually calls the entanglements of this life it calls it the cares of this world or the deceitfulness of riches. Don't raise your hand, but do you get involved with the cares of this world and the entanglements of riches? I do. If you're human, you do. The weeds of this life can get a grip on the natural man. The suckers of life, it's kind of an appropriate word, isn't it? The suckers of life can get a grip on the natural man and destroy the spiritual man inside of us. Come on. Mark 4, 7. You know, this is the story about the sower sowing seeds. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit. You know, weeds, the intentions of weeds, the intentions of suckers is to take the life away from what's growing next to it or what's growing there with it, like the suckers. It literally is, meant, it is, it is sucking it out. It's the intention of the suckers. It's the intention of the entanglement. The intentions of the cares of this world that the enemy gets us focused in on is meant to take away life. You know, Jesus, um, Jesus makes himself real to us. He brings an anointing from the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then we have a choice to make. Do we let those cares of this world suck it all out and just leave us dry? You know, I, um, I love pizza. Who likes pizza? 
It's one of my favorites. My kids say that you cook pizza too much, and I do. <laughs> um, when you get a pizza, when you cook it, um, it's really, in my mind, it's really good right away. But if you let it cool down a little bit, um, it's just not as good. Some people like cold pizza. I don't really like cold pizza. But, you know, and I'm bringing this up because in the Revelation, it says that God wants us to be hot or cold and not lukewarm. Have you ever had lukewarm pizza before? It's not very good. It's just an example. But I love hot pizza. I love it when it's fresh. And, you know, God loves it when we are hot for Him, when we desire Him, when we're passionate for Him, when we are hungry and thirsty for Him. And there's nothing that we let get in the way. The cares of this world don't get in the way. And those things that are in the way that we get rid of them. God wants us to be hot for him, hungry for him. You know, talking about hunger, Jesus was hungry one morning and he was returning to, to Jerusalem and he noticed something. This is a story that's troubled me, but I want to share this troubling story to you. He noticed a fig tree beside the road and he went over to see if there were any figs on it, but there were only leaves. And he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. Has this story troubled you in the past? Because when you look at it, it's a, there were leaves. There was some life there. And I thought, why is Jesus cursing this fig bush or fig tree. Why? And in fact, if you even look a little bit deeper into this story, it's actually shared in Mark as well, in Mark chapter 11. And in Mark 11, it talks about how it was early in the season and there were no figs that were set on yet. And, and Jesus curses the tree. I was like, this just doesn't make sense to me. Um... So I, just the more I've pondered it, the more I've heard just others speak about this scripture, I believe that the real heart of this is that we can look like a fig tree. We can have branches that look healthy. We can have leaves on it. And, and it looks like it's going to be a, a fruit-producing bush or tree, and there is nothing on it. Because from the outside, it looks great, but from the inside, something's missing. There's not getting the life flow that it needs. It's not growing. It's not developing fruit. And why is it not developing fruit? Well, it doesn't go into a lot of details about this particular fig tree, but Jesus cursed it, and he cursed it because it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. I believe this is a picture of what Jesus looks at. He's looking for us as people to produce fruit fruit. And if we're not producing fruit, we have something seriously to look at. Because what happened here, God cursed the fig tree. God can curse our lives because we're not being fruitful. Why do I say that? Because we may have the appearance of being a Christian, but we're not. We may be deceived in knowing that, well, we've got we're doing this for God. We're coming to church. We are, we look from exterior. We're even praying the right prayers, or at least it sounds like we are. But is there real fruit? Because if there really is a connection with the vine, so to speak, with God, we're going to produce fruit. And if there's no fruit in your life, we need to take a hard look at it and say, God, what... Why is there no fruit? And then take a real honest look at ourselves and turn to God, repent for that. You know, it's, it's a harsh story, but I think it really is an important one for us to look at. You know, right after the account in Mark, Mark chapter 11. In, uh, in verse 26, 
I believe it actually exposes a little of the reason why Jesus sees people not produce fruit. What is the hindrance to pleasing God? The hindrance to pleasing God, I believe, is in this scripture. It's just, just the verses that immediately pre- or afterwards, immediately after the story about the fig tree. And what it says is this. It says, but if you refuse to forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. You know, Jesus immediately brings up the fact that that we, if we choose to hold on to grudges, we choose to hold on to unforgiveness, it will suck the life out of us so that we're not fruitful. It will, I think there's the, con- the connection right there. Because the connection is if we are walking in a way that we're living in grudges or disappointments or we're living in, in a fear or upset with others, we're letting the cares of this world take precedence. And when the cares of the world takes precedence, we're entangled. And when we're entangled, we're not producing what God wants and we're not producing fruit. And as a result, God's not gonna forgive us because we're holding on to those things and we're not forgiving others. So God says, forgive and you'll be released. God says, don't hold on to grudges and you'll begin to produce fruit. Live in in an attitude of forgiveness and an attitude of of repentance because as you live there, God will work in you and he'll produce fruit. That's where I see the connection. You know, the truth is that we can, from the outside, we can look at lots of leaves and literally fool everyone. You know, in the scriptures, um, you can see people that came to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, did I not heal the sick? raise the dead, cast out demons. And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Didn't look like they were practicing lawlessness. They were praying. They were raising the dead. That's pretty significant. But from the outward point, that's all they had. They didn't have anything on the inside. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't have a relationship with the Lord. They didn't live in a state of forgiveness and repentance. So I ask you, just between you and God, consider, are you entangled with the cares of this world? Are you so drained all the time from day to day that you're really getting sucked out the life of Christ, the the spiritual life that God wants to give, is it being just drained out of you? If it is, consider this verse. Maybe there's something you're holding on to. Maybe disappointments. And those disappointments maybe relate to certain people. And who are those people? Consider that. And beginning to... Take seriously walking in forgiveness. You know, it's not enough to say that you're a Christian. It's not enough to look like a Christian. It's not enough to speak like a Christian. But if your number one priority is to please God, God's in you and you'll begin to produce fruit. So, This means if you're to go somewhere or I'm to go somewhere or decide what I'm going to do and I ask God if it pleases him, I need to be willing to deny myself if he says no. Are you in a place where you can do that? Ask the Lord, is this what you want? You know, I was reading that book. I've shared this before, but I was reading this book that's called Practicing His Presence. And Practicing His Presence was written by two authors. One of them was Frank Laubach. And Frank Laubach was one that said that he, he, every 15, 30 minutes, he was asking, Father, what do you desire said? What, Father, do you desire this minute? And then he proceeded to do it. 
that's the kind of life that God wants us to live. That's the kind of fruit that God's looking for. You know, here in just a minute, I'm going to have the worship team come on up. But I want you to consider, are you holding on to some disappointments? Are you holding on to some grudges? Are you holding on to some things that maybe you just can't shake it? It just seems to hinder you. It keeps coming back. It keeps coming back in your mind. It keeps coming back in your heart. It seems to trouble you over and over and over and over and over and over. Is there something that you just can't shake? It's choking out your life. If, you're, if you can say yes to that, then there's literally some suckers or some entanglement, some sort of weeds in your life that you need to deal with before God. There's something wrong. What's the answer? I think it's really the answer is coming repentant before God. Coming broken before God. It's in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 40, it says, be on, on guard. We have to always be on guard where disappointments can come in and they can dictate and they can take control. Be courageous or stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. It's being strong in the Lord and the power of His not, might, not our might. It's being standing firm in faith. But you know what? Honestly, sometimes we stand firm in our disappointments. Or we stand firm in our anger. Or we stand firm in our grudge. Or we stand firm in our fear. We're not going to move because we are afraid and we're not going to do it. Stand firm in the faith. Faith, that's what pleases God. You want to please God? You step out of those things. And you let God start cutting them off. You know, there's a scripture. Um, it's in John 15, 5, and it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if you do not remain in me and you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. You know what? We are all in danger if we let disappointments, we let grudges, we let anger, we let fear control us. We are in danger of not remaining in Christ because we're letting the entanglements, the cares of this world take over. And you let them take over, they will suck the lifeblood out of you. And if that happens, and the scripture's strong, it says that it's a branch, and if it's a branch, that branch was in the vine at one point, and if it was in that vine at one point, it was getting life from God at one point, but the cares of the world has made it die, and God cuts it off and throws it into the fire. This is a hard scripture. I don't want to make it lighter than it is. I'm not thinking this is just a word towards non-Christians. This is a word towards Christians. We need to beware. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. This is a wake-up call, I think, for many of us. I'd like the worship team to come up. And I want you to just come honestly before God. In Psalm 51, 17, I'll read it. It says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and con contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. God won't push us away if we come broken before him because we realize that the disappointments that we have let and consume us or the anger that we've allowed to just take control to where we walk across the room and this person is there and it disturbs us every time we see that person. If that's you, God's showing you something. God's speaking to you. And he's saying that you're holding on to grudges and you need to forgive. 
and let it release it. But you got to repent first. Repent of your sin. And then forgive them. Ask God to forgive you for not forgiving. I want you to bow your heads before the Lord, if you would. If, you know, if you're a Christian and God is just highlighting some things in you, and I just believe that the Lord would just say, you know, He is merciful. He is gracious. He, he wants to, to bring new life and to allow you to be set free from the, the suckers, the entanglements. If you're not a Christian and the Lord is, is maybe something you're just not quite sure that you want to really make commitment to, but yet you see these disappointments in your life, you see these grudges, you see these things, and you see things or people in your life that you avoid, God's speaking to you. God's speaking and he's saying, you know, now is the time to release these things. Release them to me. You know, and just before you and God come to him with these things that you know that have caused a deadening effect on you, a deadening effect on your spiritual life, a deadening effect of of really walking in freedom, but you feel imprisoned. You know, some of you, just before God, some of you are gonna need to just get out of an ungodly relationship. Some of you are gonna need to make a decision that you are gonna stop. I'm gonna be real graphic here. You're gonna have to just stop having premarital sex. You're just gonna, and, and for others of you, it's, it's, it's stopping cheating. Maybe it's cheating on your spouse. If it is, come to God. Maybe it's cheating with money or it's cheating with the way that you're treating others. It's like you'll give your all and your best to some, but to others, you just hold back. If that's you, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. It's time for you to come, come clean before God. Come with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Because God will not despise it. He will welcome you. He will cleanse you. He'll prune you. This is part of the pruning process. He wants to cut those things off of you that you might be fruitful so that the entanglements no longer dictate, but you're free of the suckers and the entanglements of life. Come honestly before God. Just you and the Lord, come to Him. as I pray, I just want you to, if you would just pray with me. You don't have to do it out loud, but just before the Lord and saying, God, I am sorry for being so selfish and self-focused and I lay it at your feet, God. I'm sorry I've given in to the disappointments and held grudges towards others. I confess it to you as sin and I confess it, God, it's it's hindered my, my life. It's taken my attention. It's consumed me. God, I call it sin, and I just come broken before you. 
I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. Thank you that you have grace for me. Forgive me, Lord. Father, show me anything else in my life that's hindering my my closeness with you, please, being pleasing to you. I want to please you, God. But God, those hindrances, show me what they are so I can lay them at your feet, God. And they won't control me anymore. I confess them to you, Lord Jesus. Set me free. I repent. I turn from these things. I turn from these bad relationships. I turn from my own anger. I turn from my own fear. I turn from my own sin. I repent. I'm turning my back on my sin and I'm coming to you, God. I'm coming to you. I'm trusting you to set me free. Set me free. Thank you, Jesus. Help me to walk in obedience to you and to please you each day. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. I want to worship you and you alone. Thank you, Lord. Worship you. Yeah.